Welcome to Massey Dialogues. Bienvenue. My name is Nathalie Desrosiers and I'm the principal of Massey College. Massey College, the beautiful college at Massey, is located on indigenous lands, the lands of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. We want to acknowledge our duty of stewardship toward the land and the great privilege that we have to be here to talk about the stars, to talk about the universe. And I'm so excited about this dialogue. And I'm particularly excited because we are welcoming the new director of the Canadian Institute for Theoretical As Astrophysics, uh, Dr. Juno Kohlmeyer. And she's a senior fellow at Massey College, and she is coming to uh, to Toronto soon. So welcome to University of Toronto. We're so excited that uh, you're joining CETA. And, and uh, I can't wait uh, to hear about your vision for, for, for CETA, but also your, your research. So welcome very much. Thank she'll you. She'll also Thank be, you. yeah, yeah. So she'll, uh, she has obviously her, her uh, pedigree is, is very impressive. She's been, uh, she's the director of an unprecedented panoptic spectroscopic survey that uh, yields infrared uh, spectra over 6 million objects. So really, I can't wait till we talk some more about this uh, emergent fields. Thank you very much for being here. She'll be joined by our two junior fellows, uh, Martin Locken, who's a third year PhD in astrophysics at University of Toronto. And she is fascinated by the large scale structure of the universe and seeks to answer the question, how can the web-like network of galaxies and dark matter help us solve the major mysteries in cosmology? So we're so happy to have you here, Martine. I think uh, you've been a junior fellow and you are at Massey, so uh, welcome and we're happy to have you. And then uh, Aria uh, Patil is also a PhD candidate in astronomy and astrophysics at the University of Toronto. She's been a junior fellow uh, since 2018. Uh, she has a bachelor degree in computer engineering from India. And her research is a little bit at the intersections of astrophysics, computer science, and statistics. She performs large scale data to understand how the Milky Way galaxy formed and evolved. So we're, she's also very interesting, uh, an avid open source developer and a member of Open Astronomy Organization under the Google Summer of Code 2021 program. She volunteers also for Tech Teach for India organization. And we are so happy to have you, Aria. It's wonderful. So let's uh, hear from uh, Dr. Kohlmeyer here first. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about your research. What does it mean? What are you working on? What does it mean? So I am interested in how structures form and evolve in the universe. And these are structures on all scales from stars and planets all the way up to galaxies and the network of galaxies and uh, cosmology and the origins of the universe. So I am a generalist. Uh, I uh, approach a lot of problems with uh, a broad toolkit. And um, and so I'm just I'm just interested in what the universe is and uh, how we can figure it out. So how did you get there? Uh, so we, did you always want it to be? A, 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 all, were you always interested in the stars? No. <laughs> uh, so actually, um, I wanted to be a lawyer like you, Natalie. Oh, but I good. failed in that pursuit. <laughs> Um, well, and uh, so I, <laughs> it was actually an, it was actually a high school research program, the Michigan State University um, High School Honor Science Program that convinced me uh, that I needed to pursue uh, physics and I needed to pursue astrophysics. I did a research program there that was um, just, just absolutely intoxicating for me and in that mm -hmm. I was able to write very basic different theoretical models and compare to data. And, um, and it was just a wonderful experience. Well, that's wonderful. And you are moving to Toronto to head uh, the Canadian Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics. Uh, and we are very delighted because CETA has offices as well here at Massey College. So we're, you know, want to uh, welcome you. 
what what do you envisage why was it uh, why is it important to have a, a an institute for theoretical astrophysics so the canadian institute for theoretical astrophysics is a very special place it's unique in the world uh, it's the only national theory program in astrophysics in the world uh, and it's incredibly important because these this theoretical work really guides our understanding of the universe. And it's really what allows us to take an incredible array of amazing observations and turn them into new understanding about what the universe is and what the, the substance of the universe is. Uh, and it's incredibly important to have theorists uh, working on that, on that problem. Uh, and so for me, this was just a really exciting opportunity to be uh, involved with a special organization uh, with an incredible history and an incredible future. So, and what do you imagine the future will be? What, uh, any particular, do you want to disclose a couple of ideas about where the future of research will be? <laughs> well, of course, we are very strong in cosmology, in mm -hmm. galaxy formation, in black hole growth and black hole uh, formation. And this is where a lot of the current mysteries lie. And mm -hmm. so that is certainly where uh, we're future research will be concentrated, absolutely. But but one thing is that we're always learning new things about the universe. And so we're very mm -hmm. enthusiastic about having a place where we're open to new ideas and mm -hmm. open to, uh, in particular, supporting the new great ideas of um, people like our junior fellows that we're joined with today. That's true, well, let's get to them. So Martine, I know that you are uh, attached to uh, to uh, to to CETA, I think you're, that's what your work is. So tell us a little bit about what you're researching. You know, the mysteries of cosmology. <laughs> so. Universe formed and evolved on very large scales, and how it will end up in the future. And to this end, I'm interested in studying uh, the large scale structure of the universe, in particular this network of matter that we call the cosmic web. So if you zoom out beyond our galaxy, beyond our local group of galaxies, uh, you start to see this pattern emerge that almost looks like a, a spider web or a sponge where the galaxies and the dark matter and the gas are distributed um, in this cosmic network. And um, some of the details of the cosmic web are, are fairly well understood by this point but there are still a lot of details that we don't understand and studying the particulars can help us um, better test our theories of structure formation and therefore also better test um, our understanding of these mysterious things like dark matter and dark energy. So I'm interested in studying particularly the, the very dense and also highly elongated regions of the cosmic web to then test different models of dark energy. So, and I, I know that you're studying g gas, I think is, is what, uh, hot gas is, is, is what, what, is that your particular field of studies there? Um, so that's uh, one of the tools that I'm using to study mm -hmm. the cosmic web. Um, so mm -hmm. there's various signals that we can look for in this cosmic network, including uh, the signals from hot gas, as well as um, just, you know, observable signals from galaxies, and um, also uh, signals from dark matter when dark matter, uh, the, the space time, and causes these funky uh, behaviors of, of the light that reaches our telescopes. So there's all these different types of ways we can research this network. And currently I'm uh, looking at the hot gas, but in the future I'll, I'll move on to studying it with those other probes as well. And com by combining all of those different probes, uh, we can better test the, the cosmological model. And uh, Aria, your area is statistics. You're managing numbers, trying to figure out the universe through, through that lens. Tell me a little bit more about what you're studying. Um, yeah, so uh, I basically want to understand how the Milky Way galaxy that we live in formed and evolved over time. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, to combine theory with observations, I'm trying to do a lot more statistical analysis. So um, just to highlight uh, a bit more about the details, I 
uh, use uh, stars or populations of stars that we see near the sun. And I measure their uh, chemistry and I measure their ages. And for that, I use all these um, new and innovative statistical techniques uh, because this uh, structure that we see in the stars in terms of their chemistry and ages tells us a lot about how the galaxy actually formed and mm -hmm. evolved over time. So that's where um, statistics comes in to actually tie the observations with the theory. So I, I want to ask you the same question that I asked Dr. Uh, Kalmeyer. How did you get to be interested, both you, uh, Martine, and Aria, about the stars? How did you get to choose this career? So Aria, how did you, why did you choose that? Yeah, so I actually started a bachelor's in computer engineering. Um, and I was always interested in physics. I was interested in mathematics and computer science. But uh, I think it took me uh, my graduate studies where I actually used my computer skills in research in astrophysics. And that's when I realized that the power of this interdisciplinary approach can actually help us know so much about the stars and the cosmos. And mm -hmm. that is why I got into this field. Yeah. And what about you, Martine? Uh, well, for me, I've been pretty obsessed with the universe uh, since <laughs> a very young age. Um, probably when I was around 10, I started watching these, you know, these programs on uh, PBS, the, the public station in the US uh, on um, you know, Einstein and on the mysteries of cosmology. I remember watching a specific mm -hmm. clip of some professor talking about dark matter and just getting really <laughs> invested and thinking, I need to spend the rest of my life thinking about these things. I can't imagine doing anything else. So for me, it's been a very kind of long haul goal. So I'm really excited to be continuing in that goal. That's wonderful. Uh, last week in, in this dialogue, we had someone talking about an old radio show in Canada that's longstanding. And he was so excited about the fact that he had done a show on astronomy and about the future of the cosmos. So, I, you know, so I think there are lots of people that are a bit like you that are always intrigued about what's going on and feel uh, humble by the fact that uh, how can we know more? Uh, and uh, so what's the what's the next step then at at CETA in terms of uh, you have these young scholars there uh, uh, what are the for the non astrophysicists in the in the room what should we look for what are the key research questions that are out there that we should pay attention to well, I think that you just heard some really great uh, examples so uh, over the next few years, there's a huge amount of observational data that's going to inform questions like what is the dark matter, what is the dark energy, uh, and how the Milky Way formed in a cosmological context. And these are the types of questions that we are trying to address theoretically at CETA and also observationally. Um, I think that one of the things I really hope to see in the next kind of two decades is answers to questions like what the dark matter is and mm -hmm. what happened at inflation uh, and whether or not those are um, simple, uh, simple answers or much more complicated and more interesting answers. So I would be looking out for those types of things. I would also be looking out for questions about uh, planet formation and what types of planets host, um, host uh, habitable conditions for mm -hmm. uh, life. Yeah. Yeah. I think we, uh, that has always been a, an obsession, I think, of people to try to see whether uh, there is, we could export the human species somewhere. Uh, Martin, what are you looking for in the next, what's, you, you know, when you uh, sit at night and what, what are you hoping to discover in the next, in, in the course of your career? <laughs> So. Well, in the course of my career, I certainly hope that we get a pretty firm understanding of what the dark matter is. Um, mm -hmm. I think we're uh, a lot closer in that question mm -hmm. than in the question about dark energy. Dark energy mm -hmm. is much more mysterious and there are very few even theories that have suggestions for what it mm -hmm. might be and they are 
really terrible at matching what we're seeing in the data. Um, whereas with dark matter, there are some pretty solid theories and there are also a lot of direct detection experiments going on, mm -hmm. which would be really neat if we could get a, a direct detection um, actually on Earth. Um, so I, I hope to understand the, at least one of the answers to those questions. And even if we don't understand exactly what is causing the effects that we, that we refer to as dark energy, which is this accelerated expansion of the universe, um, at least if we can come to better uh, describe the actual process of acceleration, understand sort of how it's changed with time, and that might be get us closer to understanding where it's originating. What about you, Aria? You know, you're, you're um, the, so the big questions. Yeah. Uh, the big questions that uh, I hope uh, will be uh, tackled by um, like me and others uh, together um, are basically like it I would like to understand how the galaxy uh, we live in actually formed um, and the evolution on um, the entire scale and I think uh, there are a lot of elements that come into understanding the evolution of the Milky Way galaxy we first need to understand how stars form and evolve and how that ties into galaxy formation and evolution. So I think on the smaller scales, I would first like to understand uh, stars like the sun and uh, what exactly is the theory behind formation of these stars in gas clouds and uh, what is their chemistry like? What do they evolve like? And then how all these populations of stars together uh, make up the galaxy. And that will also come to other questions like what is dark matter and how does that tie in into the galaxy? Um, so yeah, that's the hope of the field. So in, that in is a such way, a great... Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, I just wanted to I just wanted to pick up on something that Adia said because um, we think we understand stars like the sun, but actually uh, we understand the sun pretty well. Although there's a lot of outstanding questions with the sun, and then we want to. And now we can use all of these stars through work like the work that Adia and others are doing as clocks within the galaxy. So now we have this field of millions and even billions of clocks all spread out in the Milky Way that we want to understand better. And of course, we want to understand what happens when they die and how they're formed. And what I mean by that is we have all of these beautiful explosive transient events in the sky. We want to know what happens after the after those things uh, fade and how, you know, do they, what is the distribution of black hole masses that we have out there, uh, how how we form all those black holes. So it's just it's just such a rich area still. It's a big universe, so we got a lot to do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a big universe. And if we wanted to bring it to her Earth, like, I, is there a way to explain to, uh, to people who are about how important the field is to them, even though you know, beside the, all the curiosity that we all have about the sun, about the planet, about the Milky Way and all this, is, is there some relevance to even our, uh, our current difficulties on, on this planet, on planet Earth? Uh, Dr. Kohlmeier. Well, I think the answer is certainly yes in a few different ways. And so let me just uh, break that up into a few parts. Uh, so first of all, I think that Curiosity is the key. Astronomy is a gateway science. And I really think that, you know, all humans are endowed with an inalienable right to physics. And, uh, and so that's an important element that we all share globally. Um, and I also think that in terms of practical things, one of the best aspects of data in astronomy, these amazing data sets that we're talking about is that many of them are open and available to the public and to not just the public, but to researchers in other areas. And the Sloan Digital Sky Survey was actually very important in helping usher in that open science uh, revolution. Yeah. And I would say that that allows other advances in data science more generally to happen because that data is free and accessible and usable. So we, we can hone our methods like the ones that Aria is developing 
developing. And then maybe those aren't methods that we use uh, for uh, for for measuring the clocks all across the Milky Way, but maybe we're using those methods to monitor diseases in uh, the sewer systems mm -hmm. under cities, for example. So there are a lot of really important connections uh, related to the methodologies that are developed when we try to do kind of the hardest thing around, which is understand the universe. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So what about you, Martin, when uh, your aunt or uncle is asking you to explain, uh, you know, what's the point uh, and how does it relate to my life? What, what do you answer? <laughs> well, this is a, a common question from my aunts and uncles and grandparents <laughs> and parents. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I have a fair amount of experience answering it. But for me, the answer isn't necessarily that I, I try to make really direct connections with, um, you know, societal issues or anything like that, although I do care very much about, about many different issues in society as well. Um, for me, it is sort of what Dr. Kohlmeyer was describing, just that, you know, th it's this amazing thing about humanity that we have this drive and passion for discovery. And that discovery is valuable in its own sake. I don't think it needs to always be applied to, you know, some something that might be useful in the next year or two to be worthwhile. Um, and so even when we're studying things like the, the origins of the universe or the very yeah. largest scales, I don't think we always need to justify it by saying, oh, well, someday someone might use this, uh, you know, statistical method in another field as well. Um, I think it's worthy of studying in its own right. On its own. Well, that's the beautiful beauty of science for science sake for discovery and, and so area and are you being cross-examined by your family as well uh, at times about whether whether it's all worth it <laughs> or is that um, are people just convinced that that uh, it's worth coming to canada to study the milky way <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think um, I've had the experience that whenever I mention astrophysics um, to either my family or friends, I always get the reaction that, uh, wow, you're studying like these really cool objects in this universe. And so I think um, I've got that perspective a lot where um, the universe seems to be so mysterious to everyone. But uh, we are actually we actually know a lot about the universe uh, today and even before. So I think having that sort of a perspective, uh, telling the public that uh, there's all this knowledge um, that we've um, accumulated over the years. So um, I think that's always been fascinating to people. And I have to point out. We're all women here, so uh, so it's uh, is it new to have uh, women in STEM in the sciences like this? You know, being at the PhD level and heading a, a new theoretical astrophysics, is is that uh, did you have to struggle a little bit, Dr. Kohlmeyer, in in your life for being ta to be taken seriously as an astrophysicist? Uh, so I think that I think there are many different struggles uh, that everybody has in their life uh, in many different dimensions. I would say that for me, um, you know, a big struggle was just that, uh, you know, I didn't have uh, parents that were uh, had gone to college. And so I didn't have a sort of path that was obvious. And I, you know, didn't know what was available in terms of Okay, where 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 is the best place to do physics and that kind of thing? So I, I mean, I literally just went to the same school that my high school advisor guy went to, and that that worked out. That was Caltech. It's a pretty good school. Um, so um, you know, so I think everyone has struggles, but I think one mm -hmm. of the things that I think is so important is that whether it be um, you know whatever the struggles you are having, it's really the persistence is such an important feature of scientific discovery because it's very difficult yeah. uh, for everybody mm -hmm. to make discoveries. And it is very challenging to really um, just keep at it, keep at it, keep mm -hmm. at it. And I would say that that feature more than uh, many other features is, uh, and I, I don't know if that's a, 
a personality thing or a psychological, I don't know where, I don't know what chromosome right. persistence sits on, <laughs> but um, to me, yeah. that's a very important aspect of making discoveries. And I would say that, um, I would say that everybody who is, uh, who, who certainly who is here today, uh, but also who persists in, in discovery has, has that feature. So do you feel like this, Martine, that you ha are a relentless uh, observer and that you need a lot of patience to, to be in your field? Um, it definitely requires patience and persistence. There can be a lot of frustrations when, you know, debugging your code or struggling through some tough physics equations, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. But I think I've, I've also been very lucky and very privileged in, in life to have a relatively easy path compared to, you know, some people. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, you know, you asked if this is a new thing. Um, yeah. I think, I mean, from what I'm aware of, yeah, over the last few decades, the number of women in the, in, you know, the physical sciences has definitely been growing. Um, but I think it's important to note that, um, like black and indigenous women have been mm -hmm. fairly left behind by this growth. And so I think a lot of the um, diversity initiatives and the attempts to break down some of these barriers have often only benefited uh, white women. And so I think this is like uh, the next really important thing to focus on is, is making sure everyone can come along this journey because I think we're, we're missing out on a lot of brilliant minds around the world mm -hmm. from a lot of the systemic barriers and, you know, non-inclusive environments and stuff that very much still exist. So what about you, Aria? Were you encouraged as a young woman to go into science or did you have to find it on your own? Um, so I think um, the perspective I have from India is a little different in the sense that uh, it is still new to uh, get your daughters educated. Uh, I personally feel like I was, um, uh, I have a lot of gratitude to my parents who really looked out for me getting educated um, mm -hmm. and me pursuing my goals. So mm -hmm. um, I really admire the efforts that my parents took. And mm -hmm. um, uh, being in a city, I think uh, that was also another perspective because yeah. as uh, Dr. Kohlmeyer mm -hmm. previously mentioned, in rural areas, there's even more barriers for women to um, get educated and even get like primary basic education. So mm -hmm. I think it is very important for the systemic barriers to start from the very beginning of mm -hmm. um, basic education so that slowly as um, we go up uh, in terms of education levels, it keeps improving. And that's one of your uh, interests, isn't it? I mean, you're, you're part of an organization that, uh, what does it do teach India? What's the, what's the role of it? Um, so this organization essentially is all about um, teaching underprivileged uh, children, uh, mm -hmm. especially in rural areas, so that um, they get the right exposure towards science. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of times uh, it is important to just uh, provide the right exposure uh, mm -hmm. to children and let them know that their dreams can be achieved. So I mm -hmm. think that's where uh, the volunteers come in um, we usually try to uh, get the students excited about science and um, other fields uh, as well and uh, try to tell them that there are opportunities they can pursue. And certainly I think it is true, as Dr. Kohlmeyer said, that uh, the universe, seeing the universe and wanting to understand it is, is a, 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 you described it as a pathway to science almost because the, the curiosity is so stimulated. Uh, are these special initiatives that must continue to be done to kind of break down barriers? Is, is it still a little bit of a, uh, you know, it, physics you need to to uh, people are afraid of taking physics or they stuff that yeah this should is, be done I mean, <laughs> I mean just the number of people and i mean mm -hmm. i do think that i do think that this is um as aria nicely uh pointed out and as martine nicely pointed out um you know there are uh, a lot of of barriers to uh mm -hmm. You know, you go to a playground and you watch the kids and you see, okay, they're all physicists. And then somewhere along the way, they decide that, oh, I can't do that. 
And so something is going very wrong very early on um, where we are not, um, you know, and I consider this a great theft actually of something that people are born with. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so I believe that it is super important to focus on uh, education at all levels, of course, and also just the, um, just really empowering people to have the tools to, uh, you know, I'm very big on teaching math and uh, and mm -hmm. physics to young children, very, very young, because mm -hmm. I do think that these are very empowering tools that um, that then once you have those, they go with you everywhere, whether you become a scientist or you become a lawyer, or you become yeah. a business person. <laughs> or, and so these are, this is just into my mind an incredibly important, uh, there are just so many different, it's a, it's a hyperspace of uh, challenges mm -hmm. to opportunity. And we want to make that we want to make all of those barriers go away as much as we can. And, and of course, uh, you know, education at an early age is important. And I locked into this wonderful program and this wonderful mm -hmm. mentor. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, and, you know, who knows what kind of damage mm -hmm. I would have been doing otherwise. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, you mentioned you might have been a lawyer. So there's <laughs> still lots of work to do. No shortage of injustice to, to correct. But one of the things we discussed before uh, we went on air was uh, some of the necessity a little bit to look uh, at the role of humanity in, in understanding the universe, even from a legal point of view, you know, the way in which we don't want to throw our garbage out and don't want to bring uh, specimens that could actually pollute uh, the, the universe. So this entire area, and we discussed a little bit, how I think the legal framework for understanding the cosmos may be a bit outdated. Is that something that that is discussed among uh, uh, in, in uh, the astrophysicist group? I would say that the more senior you get, the more you think about it and discuss it. And I think that's a good mm -hmm. thing. I think the, the the youth should be protected from some of those <laughs> issues and it's our job to actually do that. I think mm -hmm. that this is a very complicated problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that it is, as you note, very outdated. We, mm -hmm. uh, we don't have the new sort of rules of the road for the 21st mm -hmm. century and how we are going to um, you know, how, how we're going to explore and we want to explore. So it's always an important thing, balancing that drive for exploration, which is just within all of us uh, and, mm -hmm. and also that need for responsibly doing so, so that, mm -hmm. you know, because this is, <laughs> and we have to keep that in mind at all times. Is that something, is that, so the ethical questions that uh, confront astrophysicists, uh, I'm always uh, interested in how, when we approach a new field, we want to think a little bit about the ethics. Do you discuss that sometime, Martin? Do you reflect on what are the ethics framework for your work? Absolutely. Yeah, I think a lot of people think of astronomy as <laughs> so far removed from humanity that we have no ethical responsibility to anyone. Um, but that's definitely mm -hmm. not true. And so mm -hmm. you, know, you you were talking about things like space debris and, you know, uh, legal issues and, and questions of colonizing the moon and things like that. Um, but I think also on Earth, it's important that we um, take a long, hard look at um, our activities mm -hmm. on Earth. So, mm -hmm. for example, um, a lot of telescope lands are on indigenous lands, and mm -hmm. um, many telescopes were built with not yeah. full consent mm -hmm. of the local I think this is a major issue that we need to address and um, be a lot better about moving forward. Um, in addition, uh, astronomy is very, uh, is not the most sustainable field in terms of the environment. <laughs> um, astronomers fly a lot and because observers fly to telescopes and we use a lot of computing resources, et cetera, um, you know, the sort of typical astronomer compared mm -hmm. to the average person has you know, far more uh, carbon emissions. I can't remember the exact amount, maybe mm -hmm. two times or three times more or something than like mm -hmm. the average working Canadian. So yeah. um, we're doing pretty bad on that front. And so I'm um, part of a couple of groups that are working on improving the sustainability of Canadian astronomy. And I think those issues, yeah. the sustainability and also issues of indigenous sovereignty in many ways tie together. Uh -huh. 
That's interesting. I, I did not know that telescopes were uh, built in this, and uh, but I know that all graduate uh, and all academics sometimes have to worry about their carbon footprint because the traditional let's let's have a conference uh, somewhere and and let's bring all our graduate students and so on. So maybe the pandemic has had some impact on the way in which we conduct business in the future. What about you, Aria? Any any uh, ethical or questions that that arise in your work or in your in your in the the way in which you approach your future career um so um i think uh, not specifically with the to my career but i definitely think a lot about how um like a few decades ago we didn't think that we would be like sending rovers to mars uh, or it it's something yeah. that recently happened and mm -hmm. soon there's um all these programs coming up about exploration within the solar system and uh, at one point maybe the question of uh is earth unique uh, will come up and whether we want to explore um other uh, systems mm -hmm. beyond uh, just our solar system so i guess at that point we will have to think a lot about uh, the legal aspect of mm -hmm. it about where mm -hmm. we stand as humanity and how much um, like changes or how um, much of effect that we have overall on the universe. Well, I as think, Dr. Yeah, go ahead, Dr. I was just going to pick up a little bit on that. I mean, I do mm -hmm. think that, um, you know, one thing that astronomers have a very uh, different perspective on is, mm -hmm. is our cosmic place in the universe and mm -hmm. in terms of um, habitability and in terms of the earth. Uh, I do think that uh, we have a responsibility to make it very clear <laughs> uh, that, uh, you know, habitability is not just uh, something mm -hmm. that you uh, toss away so easily. Um, it's actually quite, um, you know, we're, we're, we have a lot, there's a lot more uninhabitable planets than habitable planets to our knowledge uh, by quite, uh, you know, several orders of magnitude. And so, uh, so it is very important that we cherish our place here on earth and that we are responsible and focused in our mission right? Uh, we're very lucky, as you've heard, all of us, extremely lucky to have as our job, discovering the mysteries of the universe. And in my mind, that is something that we all have to take extremely seriously, because there's a lot of other jobs that are, that are not as, um, you know, that are not as uh, mm -hmm. uh, intellectually liberating to do. And so I mm -hmm. take the view that we really have to be extremely uh, rigorous and devoted to that uh, mm -hmm. because it is such a privilege to be here on earth but also mm -hmm. um, be studying this amazing stuff mm -hmm. and i was uh, struck when we spoke earlier you mentioned like the the humans don't own the cosmos you know they, they so i think this entire a little bit the humility probably that you get if you are constantly uh, looking at the world from uh from this large uh ever expanding or ever restricting uh, universe <laughs> uh so what's the when you when you think about what would be how do you recruit new people uh to to be in this field uh beside patience <laughs> what are the other qualities that you get think are are in point to to be a good astrophysicist well, in terms of theory, uh, mm -hmm. it's certainly important to really, you know, the more math you know, uh, the better. Uh, so that's certainly mm -hmm. an extremely important thing for people to value and to take seriously and to give a lot of love and attention to. Uh, so that's very mm -hmm. important. Our field is very collaborative and it takes all mm -hmm. different styles. So mm -hmm. just between the three ast astrophysicists mm -hmm. you have here, you have three totally different styles of doing mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, astrophysics. Okay. And I think yeah. being able to um, being able to, to to successfully operate in a in a collaborative environment while also preserving your own individual style and and putting mm -hmm. your you know I view this very much as a, an art and a craft and mm -hmm. so we all put our individual um, um, flavor to the uh, to the different ideas and we synthesize a lot of ideas in a particular way and I think 
I think that is also very important, sort of synthetic thinking and not mm -hmm. just sort of narrowly focusing mm -hmm. in really, really trying to, uh, and this has been true since, you know, this has been true forever because, mm -hmm. you know, if you think about even Newton, uh, you know, he, he figured out action at a distance from alchemy, right? <laughs> so not such yeah. a great alchemist, but a good physicist. Yeah. <laughs> and, we, and that, that type of synthetic thinking is still very important today. So what about you, uh, Martin? Any, any thoughts on, on if you're trying to recruit uh, people in your field? Uh, what advice do you give them? Um, yeah, so I do sometimes uh, talk to undergrads and high school students. Mm -hmm. um, and Typically, I give them the advice of, of keep trying and don't give up when you're applying for research positions or struggling through a really difficult class. Um, I think it's it's really easy to get discouraged, um, especially if you don't see yourself in the field. Um, if you don't see people who look like you in the field, it's I think it's easy to internalize any kind of um, mistakes that you make or you know a bad grade as something that's some like inherent to you as a person instead mm -hmm. of just a mistake that you've made and something you can learn from and i know i did a lot of that in undergrad and there were so many mm -hmm. times that i questioned whether i was smart enough to continue with this um and i think sometimes people don't talk about that later on like all of the mm -hmm. times that they doubted themselves um but yeah especially like being in very male dominated mm -hmm. physics classes especially at the upper level was constantly questioning you know my mm -hmm my place in this? Yeah. Can I can I continue? Um, so yeah, I think my advice to everyone is uh, keep going and also find a good support system and find um, others that you can, you know, if you're in undergrad or in high school, that you can do your homework with. Um, mm -hmm. Problem sets rarely get done on one's own. You usually have to collaborate. <laughs> and that, like uh, Dr. Colmar was saying, that spirit of collaboration uh, is going to serve you really well later on as well. Um, because, uh, yeah, science rarely ever gets done um, individually these days. So uh, we have some uh, some questions from our viewers here. Uh, Zoe is asking, I have two questions. I was very intrigued by the webs uh, Martine talked about. Could you explain more what that means? Let's start with you, uh, Martine, and then I'll ask the second question. Sure, yeah. So I mentioned the cosmic web which is this name that we give to the large scale network of matter in the universe. Um, so, you know, we live on Earth, which is in the solar system, and our sun is just one of many billions of galaxies and it's billions of stars in our galaxy. But if you zoom out beyond our own Milky Way galaxy, mm -hmm. you start to see that our galaxy has neighbors, we have Andromeda, we have smaller galaxies near us, mm -hmm. and we live in this local group. And if you zoom out even further than that, you start mm -hmm. to see this pattern emerge where you have clusters of, you know, tens to hundreds, sometimes even thousands of galaxies. And then you have these long uh, structures called filaments, which consist of galaxies and dark matter and gas. And often those filaments then connect to other galaxy clusters and uh, multiple galaxy clusters can even connect together to form super clusters and all in all it ends up looking like this web it's kind of like a spider web where you have these dense <laughs> nodes and then these sort of long strands connecting matter and then where the matter is not there's these large voids um, huge empty regions where there is very little matter um, and so all in all we call this the cosmic web so let's, uh, uh, any other comments from uh, before we get the other questions? I hope that we're going to put back up the question, if you don't mind. Yes. So are there accessible resources you recommend to understand more the mysteries you're trying to investigate? I just finished The End of Everything by Katie Mack and would love to learn more. So yeah what are the what's the to-do list what's the let's read for the summer so that we get to understand the universe better aria are they things that you uh, that you would recommend as a as a reading resource um 
Yeah, so I guess um, one of the books that I read in my undergrad, uh, when I didn't really know anything about um, astrophysics, like uh, I knew some things, but I wasn't really doing much research. And at that time, I uh, remember reading a lot of books by uh, Stephen Hawking, actually. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I found that um, the grand design, for example, it starts with um, a lot of um, explanation about what the universe is like in uh, a very public outreach format. And then it slowly goes into a lot more depth. And I usually like those a lot. Um, and I think as uh, Martin mentioned before, PBS documentaries, um, there there's so many uh, documentaries out there that are really accessible to the general public. What about you, Dr. Uh, Komayer? Any uh, recommended reading list? <laughs> Uh, so I think there's a number of really interesting popular accounts that are coming out now. And so I think it would be a great idea to curate the Massey Astrophysics Summer Reading List. And yeah. so I love that idea. <laughs> and I think we're going to do that. Um, I think one of the things that I would also recommend for those of you who are maybe not the, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of sit with a book uh, and devour it type is... Um, uh, the Voyages website uh, uh, on sdss.org. That'll give you an opportunity to kind of interrogate some data and the citizen science projects in the Zooniverse, which actually okay. the Zooniverse started in SDSS. Um, these are great resources if you want to really, um, if you're like me and maybe not, um, not reading the popular books so much, but you want to just get your hands dirty with some actual, uh, actual experiments, I really recommend those. Uh, and I think that there are, um, but I, but I will, I, we will take it as a homework assignment to curate the uh, yes. must reads for summer. <laughs> well, it, you have to, because one of the series we have is Massey loves to read, you know, that's one of the, <laughs> the, the one of our series. And one the question I was going to ask you is, uh, do you read science fiction uh, in your off time like do you read things that or is just that's too too weird a few yes. there's a few okay. really i mean so ray bradbury's books i mean there's mm -hmm. a few science fiction books that i think have just just such import for kind of a broader broader messages mm -hmm. um i i tend to read nonfiction uh, myself mm -hmm. uh, when i get an opportunity to read but um i have to say i've been very busy <laughs> Lately, yeah, yeah. and I, yeah. I have not read as much as uh, mm -hmm. uh, Toronto. But uh, in terms of, um, you know, in terms of, uh, yeah, so, I personally, yeah, I'm not a, I'm not a huge science fiction buff. But I do think that there's a lot of really nice science fiction out there that has broader implications. Mm -hmm. Well, that's my question was. I, and I, I'll ask the same question to Martin and Aria. As a kid, were you reading science fiction or was it not really the pathway toward uh, your goal in life of understanding the universe? Martin. I also have to admit that I'm not a huge fan of sci-fi. Um, <laughs> Good. No, wait, this isn't, this isn't like all astronomers hate sci-fi thing. Um, I think it's just some of no. us. Uh, not that we I even hate it. I don't hate sci-fi. I don't hate sci-fi. Not, not sci that you hate it, sorry. <laughs> um, I just, I've never been a huge fan of it. There are lots <laughs> in our department who, they have sci-fi Fridays and watch uh, sci-fi <laughs> shows and stuff. So there are definitely people who enjoy that. Um, I've read a couple, but yeah, I think I was, like Aria mentioned, I was more interested in reading things like The Grand Design or, you know, watching mm -hmm. these uh, documentaries rather than, you know, reading stuff that's, you you might learn some physics from, but you're not sure if, if it's correct. If it's the right part, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, never huge What about you, Aria? Any, any uh, advice on sci-fi or not? In which group do you, do you, do you fall? <laughs> Uh, I do, I do like science fiction quite a bit, but if it, mm -hmm. if we go back like really in time to the um, stage of like Star Trek and Star Wars, it's probably a little less of the fi science fiction exactly, but 
that's what uh, the science fiction love kind of originated from. And then you have like, uh, in the last few years, there's been really great movies being made, right, from Interstellar to um, so many others that I've really enjoyed. So um, I think I definitely do fall under the, like, sci science fiction category. Good. So okay, we I have just to want to diversity. say that I don't dislike science fiction, okay? <laughs> I do not, like, I'm a huge Trekkie. I just want to say, I don't know, I'm not getting that right. Uh, but um, in terms of... Um, in terms of like, you know, the truth is really interesting. So I like, <laughs> you know, the, I think what was interesting too about Star Trek in particular is that it actually touches on a lot of, it, you know, kind of, um, yeah, ethical questions and social mm -hmm. sort of questions about exploration. And I think those are the, that, those touch points. And it's the same with, I think the really great, um, you know, science fiction that, that it really mm -hmm. actually brings together sort of, you know, like the Martian, you know, aspects about mm -hmm. science, but also, you know, this is a classic, you know, human versus nature, human versus themselves um, struggle. Mm -hmm. And I think those are really universal. So I just want to say that I think it's okay <laughs> to read science fiction. It's okay not to read science fiction. Like, let's, uh, yeah, you know, true. let's. <laughs> so uh, what uh, do you, are you observers like do you have a, a telescope do, are you an amateur observers I know that there is at Massey College a group of, of uh, uh, that likes to go outside and look at the stars and and so on. are you part of that do you uh, as a, or is it too amateur and you've looked enough of stars during the day you don't you're not looking at it uh, as a as a hobby area Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, actually, one of the things that uh, people think when we say we study astrophysics is that we look at stars really often and we do observations all throughout the night is usually what is expected. Um, but most of the time, because of like these great surveys such as SDSS that Dr. Kohlmeier is leading, uh, we have this massive amount of data uh, right at our disposal. Um, so I don't really have to go out and observe for my work. <laughs> so that's something I really enjoy doing outside of work because it's something mm -hmm. that I really enjoy about the universe. And I feel like there's somewhat of a disconnect sometimes between my work mm -hmm. and actually observing things. So mm -hmm. I really enjoy doing that um, outside of work. What about you, Martine? Um, yeah, well, so you mentioned the Massey Astronomy Group. So it was, I believe it was Aria and um, Michael O'Shea who uh, yeah. had put in that proposal for the Massey Telescope and it's sitting in my room right now. Um, <laughs> so Good. we, we got to take it out once the weather gets nice. It's been pretty cloudy recently. Um, so yeah, I, I, I enjoy that on an occasional, you know, warm night. Mm -hmm. But there's not a whole lot that you can see from Toronto, especially. Um, there's mm -hmm. a lot of light pollution here, so um, you know you can get, you can get a really nice image of the moon with our little telescope here. But um, I have really appreciated the few times in my life that I've been in an actual good dark sky location, mm -hmm. like in Hawaii, um, where mm -hmm. a lot of the telescopes are located. Um, that was really awe-inspiring, and I, I think. Mm -hmm no no amount of pictures from you know the Hubble Space yeah. Telescope or you know mm -hmm. artist representations can really match up to seeing the dark sky mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. on its own you know without any light pollution and I think it's really sad mm -hmm. that so many humans you know to, in today's mm -hmm. world have never mm -hmm. even seen a dark sky mm -hmm. like that mm -hmm. you know so humans and so I think it's important to protect those dark sky areas. Um, and make sure that that people have access to them by um, bringing people out of the city and, and going on sort of field trips and stuff like that. So, what about you, Dr. Komeyer? Do you go on field trips to, uh, <laughs> to I look love at it. the stars? I love it so much. <laughs> I love it so. I'm a theorist, so they they try to keep me away from the telescope so I don't break anything. But then I had to, you know, start this whole survey so that I could uh, have access. But even now, they they like to keep me away from the equipment. But um, mm -hmm. but yeah, just in particular, I just want to highlight that uh, meteor showers are just uh, so fun. Uh, I think it's just such a great um, experience to be disconnected from 
Mm -hmm. uh, all of this uh, Zooming and all of the mm -hmm. various things that distract us. Mm -hmm. I think it's so important, even if the weather isn't so great, even if you can't see very much from where you are, go outside, look at Aldebaran, think about the fact that you're looking at something that was painted uh, 20,000 years ago in the caves of Lascaux, uh, and yeah. just be connected to mm -hmm. you know whoever you're with and to this uh, just incredible history and and uh, and kind of common common hopefully future we all have. Um, yeah. I think it's just so important and I think it's so universal and and I, I do uh, agree with Martine that you know we people need to get uh, get access to those dark skies and uh, and and we need to we need to actually uh, make sure that that kids are connected to that to that experience because it is something that that is humbling and it's important and now in the age of uh, sort of of maybe a little bit of like social media narcissism, people sort of forget their place in the universe. And I think it's it's much better to to think about that humbling aspect and it's much more fun actually. Uh, so so I'm a huge fan. If they let me near a telescope, I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> well, so uh, as you say, we have one at, at Massey. Uh, so I we're getting to the end of our hour. I just want you to maybe, uh, what would you want the audience to remember from this this dialogue uh, and uh, your key messages a little bit to our audience? I'll start with you, uh, uh, Aria. Um, so the key messages that uh, I would like people to take from this uh, dialogue is that uh, the universe is exciting and um, we always uh, need more researchers and uh, collaboration is something that uh, astronomy loves. So uh, as much as an interdisciplinary approach we can get into astrophysics, uh, the better it's going to be. And uh, as much representation we can get from um, women in STEM, from uh, people of color in STEM, and um, all the other uh, equity and diversity issues that uh, we want to tackle. Um, things are going to get better. Good, that's great message. Martin. Yeah, to echo what Aria said, um, science improves the, the more people that have access to it. Um, so we want to make sure that, you know, brilliant minds out there aren't getting left behind from all of these mm -hmm. systemic barriers. And, and another key takeaway is that there's a lot of exciting things happening in the next few decades uh, in astronomy because there are these huge surveys that have already happened, but more are coming online. And so we're going to have a huge wealth of data and we need uh, new fresh perspectives to come in and, and think about how to tackle that data and how to uh, come up with theories that we can test using that data. That's wonderful, that's exciting. What about you, Dr. Gohmeyer? <laughs> Last words to you. Be curious, be ambitious, strive for the stars. That's perfect. And the stars were aligned today. So my stars were aligned with all, all three of you. I want to thank you so much for uh, sharing your time and welcome to Toronto. I think uh, I thank know you. that we've inspired uh, people to go out, look at the universe and read more about it. We, you know, the duty to know about the cosmos is incumbent of all of us. I want to thank our tech team that allowed us to be here together today, despite uh, California and uh, different places. So, merci. Thank you to uh, Matt uh, uh, Glanfield and to Alisa Gainsbourg. And we'll see you next week for another dialogue. Thank you. Thank you all.